For Notion's many competitive advantages, its lack of an API long deterred many potential users. And for those of us who did adopt the tool, the API has been the most requested feature by far and a daily topic in online conversations. But every time we'd get a hint of a release, days, weeks, months would pass without an update. And then our wish finally came true this May when Notion's API entered public beta. And this milestone is really worth the hype. It opens a world of new opportunities in Notion. So let's explore the fundamentals of the API and how to use it with a few simple examples. And then in subsequent posts and videos, I'll dive deeper into more complex implementations of the API. So be sure to subscribe to the newsletter at notion.vip and to this YouTube channel. So API stands for Application Programming Interface. And APIs allow apps to integrate with other apps where they can exchange information and make updates to each other. So apps that schedule social media posts use the Facebook and Twitter APIs. Accounting apps use your bank's API, and tools that merge your cloud drives do so with the APIs of Google Drive, Dropbox, and other services. Pretty much anytime you see the term sync or integration in a service, it's likely using an API. So the Notion API gives you two overarching capabilities. The first is that you can connect Notion with other apps to exchange information and make updates, where if you make an update in one app, the change is reflected in the other app. And that means you can sync your contacts, your calendar events, your expenses, and other information from a variety of of sources. And then the API also gives you the ability to create automations within your workspace. So another widely requested feature among Notion users has been recurring tasks. And with the API, you can automatically recreate or reschedule a task when it's completed. And Notion's API really has two primary types of users. Developers access it directly to build integrations between Notion and their apps. And then everyday users then configure those integrations without needing to code. So we're going to focus on those everyday non-coders. And in Notion, integrations function like a special type of user, where once an administrator has added an integration, then users of the workspace can then grant that integration access to a page from the Pages Share menu. And remember, when you grant a user, or in this case, an integration access to a page, then that in integration is going to gain access to all of that page's sub-pages as well. Within this People database, we can click on the Share menu and see that it has access to three different integrations. And for any of those integrations, we can remove access. And then if we go into the Add, People, Email Groups, and Integrations option here, at the bottom of the list, we can see the available integrations, those that have been configured by an administrator. So if we choose one, we can click Invite, and that's going to give the integration access to this database. And remember, again, when you grant a user or an integration access to a page or a database, it's going to gain access to all of the inner pages of that page as well. So at the debut of the API, Notion offers three official integrations. One is Typeform, which is a tool used for creating online forms. And through the integration, you can send submissions from the form directly to a Notion database. And then the other two integrations are services that allow you to create custom integrations with apps that don't yet have official integrations. And one of those services is Zapier, and the other is called Automate.io. So let's look first at the Typeform integration. So here we have a type form that collects contact information. And in Notion, we have a people database that contains contact information for each person. And this database contains a property for each question of the type form. So once the form is published and the database is configured with a property that corresponds with each question of the type form, we can go into the connect area 
of Typeform and search for Notion. And we'll click Connect within Notion, and then we'll authenticate the Typeform account. And we'll authenticate the Notion account. And when you authenticate Notion, you're going to choose the pages that you want the integration to be able to access. Now, you can be selective about this, but I generally just choose the entire workspace because that's going to allow the integration to access any database for future needs. So you click Allow Access, and then in this third step, we'll refresh. And that's going to allow us to choose the database for this particular use of the integration. In our case, it's the people database. And when you choose the database, you'll then have the option to map each question of the type form to its corresponding property. And I want to note that if you have a multiple choice question that maps to a select or multi-select property in Notion, you're going to want to make sure that those options are pre-configured within the Notion database. So with each type form question mapped to its corresponding property in the Notion database, we can click Save Mapping. And the integration is finalized, so when we make submissions using the form, they'll appear within that database. So let's give it a quick demonstration here. So with the form submitted, we can pop over to the People database and we can see that Tim Cook has been populated. And in a demonstration coming up here shortly, we'll talk about how we can programmatically populate the full name. So as I mentioned, Zapier and Automate.io are services where you can create custom integrations with apps that don't yet offer official integrations. In Zapier, you create Zaps, and in Automate.io, you create Bots. So each Zap and Bot has a trigger followed by one or more actions. And basically, you're creating a formula that says, if trigger, do actions. So Zaps and Bots can be triggered by Notion, by other apps, or by these sorts of internal monitors you can configure in Zapier and Automate.io. And in Notion, you can trigger a Zap or a Bot by adding an item to a database. And in Automate.io, you can also trigger a Bot by updating an item in a database, which is a considerable advantage of Automate.io over Zapier. So a couple of examples of this include updating a meeting within an events database or adding a new contact within a context database. And then you can also trigger Zaps and bots from other apps, in which case your actions would occur in Notion. So a couple of examples here include favoriting a song in Spotify, updating a contact in Salesforce, or creating an event in a Google Calendar. And then Zapier and Automate.io also include internal monitors that can trigger your Zaps and bots. So you can use these to set a recurring schedule, to receive emails, and more. So, for example, you can trigger your Zap on the first day of each month, or whenever a provided email address receives an email containing a new task, that task can be added to a tasks database. So we can trigger zaps and bots within Notion, within other apps, and through these internal monitors. And those triggers initialize one or more actions, which, like triggers, can occur within Notion, within other apps, or within internal functions of Zapier and Automate.io. And almost always, actions are going to reference information provided by the trigger, such as the ID of the page that was updated or a personal trait of a contact that was added. 
So in Notion, your actions will typically be adding or updating database items. So if your trigger is an updated Salesforce contact, for example, you can update the same contact in your contacts database in Notion. And if your trigger is a song favorited in Spotify, you can add that song to a songs database in Notion. And then if your Zapper bot is triggered in Notion, you'll often want the actions to occur in other apps. So some examples here are if a person is added to your contacts database in Notion, add that contact to Salesforce. And if a meeting is added to an events database in Notion, create the event in Google Calendar. And then Zapier and Automate.io offer a variety of internal actions that often serve as interim steps before other actions. So for example, you can reformat information to make it more suitable for its destination. For example, you could reformat a birthday from its numeric format to its written format and then apply that written format to an email that is sent in a subsequent action. And you can also perform calculations such as determining the age of a person from that person's birthday. And then that age could then be applied to an age property in the final destination. And Zapier and Automate.io also allow you to filter content and proceed only if certain conditions are met. So you, you might want to publish a social media post only if its status property is final. And Zapier also allows you to create sequences where certain actions are taken if the filter is true and then alternative actions are taken if it's false. And this is going to be one of the advantages of Zapier over Automate.io. So I've mentioned a few of these subtle differences between Zapier and Automate.io, which you'll want to consider when choosing the right automation service for your particular needs. And at launch of the API, Automate.io allows you to trigger bots from updated database items, whereas Zaps are only triggered from new database items. However, Zapier allows you to create these conditional paths for various outcomes of your filters, although you could technically create paths in Automate.io by chaining bots. Zapier also supports more apps, but overall you'll find it to be more expensive than Automate.io. So for a more detailed comparison of these services, you can review their pricing pages, which I'll link to within the notes of this video. So an admin will configure the Automate.io integration when creating a bot. When you want to use Notion for the first time in Automate.io, whether as the trigger app or the action app, you'll search for Notion, choose it under add a new app, and then I typically leave the default name, just Notion, and click authorize. And at this point, once again, you'll select the pages that you want to grant the integration access to. And I typically choose all pages of my workspace, but you can be more selective. And then you'll click allow access and then save. And that finalizes the integration. So you can now use Notion within bots as both the trigger apps and the action apps. And one note on using Notion with Automate.io, a lot of times when you choose a Notion database, Automate.io will want that database to have a created time and or a last edited time property for reasons of tracking updates and so forth. So what you'll do in your database, these are special types of properties. So if you wanna add a created time, you can name it and then under the advanced options for property types, you can choose created time here. And then we can also add a last edited time. And then these are automatically populated according to when the items were created or last edited. And then you can just hide these properties from all views of your workspace if you never want to see them. And so when you choose Notion and then you choose a database, 
you can map those last edited and created times properties where requested in automate.io and that'll give it the information that it needs. And then the Zapier integration is a little bit more cumbersome to configure. So an admin will visit notion.so slash my dash integrations. And there the admin will create a new integration. And I like to format service with an arrow and then the workspace that you integrate it with. So in this case, it would be Zapier and an arrow and we're using the nut labs workspace and then you can optionally upload a logo and then you'll want to make sure to indicate the workspace for this particular instance of the integration and then click submit and then you'll be given a secret which you can show and copy and you'll use that in zapier but before you use that in zapier you're going to want to go to the database where the integration will need access, at least for this first use of it. So what you'll do is you go to the share menu and you'll click the add people option and you'll see that new integration that you just created. So you'll choose that and then click invite and that gives the Zapier integration access to this particular database. Now you'll need to do that for each database that you want the integration to access or grant it high level access to sort of a parent page of multiple databases and therefore you won't have to do it on a database by database basis. So then in Zapier when you're building your Zap when you use Notion for the first time, you can search for it among the apps and you'll indicate your trigger event, which is going to be a new database item. And the initial configuration will ask you to sign in to Notion. And this is where you'll paste the secret that you copied. So you'll paste it and click continue and that's going to allow you to proceed with the creation of your zap and we'll be looking at an example here momentarily before we look at some of those examples i want to mention a strategy that you can use to optimize your workspace for the api if you're familiar with my resources you know i approach every notion workspace with a single core tenant and in the simplest terms that is to use databases not pages and long before the api this strategy afforded numerous benefits and it's the crux of my bulletproof methodology which is the most widely employed framework and top selling template among Notion users. And the API makes this database first approach even more advantageous. You'll notice a constant in all of the integration examples that we discuss, and that is databases. So integrations almost always match a property of a Notion database to a value in another app. For example, the first name of a person in your contacts database with the first name of a contact in Salesforce. And therefore, if you uphold this database-centric strategy, you'll position your workspace to leverage all of the current and future integrations. And you can dive deeper into this concept in my post dedicated to optimizing your workspace for the API, which I'll link to within the video description. So we saw a practical implementation of the type form integration in our contact details form and people database. Now let's build on that with two more simple examples, one using Zapier and the other using automate.io. And in my future resources, I'll cover more complex configurations. So do stay tuned to my newsletter, YouTube channel, and Twitter feed. So we'll start with the automate.io example. Now you'll recall that our contact form sends new contacts to our people database and that's going to populate all of the properties but it leaves the full name property 
blank. And what we can do with automate.io is automatically populate that full name property by merging the first name and last name properties, separating them with a space. So I've eliminated the initial configuration of automate.io with Notion so that we can see the full process from the beginning. So to begin that process, you'll create a new bot and then search for Notion as we saw previously. Choose Notion under add an app, leave the default name, select pages. And again, I like to just choose all pages of the workspace and complete that configuration process. So for this particular but we want to trigger it when a new person is added to that people database. Now, remember, automate.io also allows you to trigger your bots from updated entries. But in this instance, we want to use a new database item. So we'll use new database item as the action and then we'll choose the database, which is our people database. And this is going to display all the fields that will be output from the trigger. So this is the information that the actions can reference. So for our action app, we are also going to use Notion because we want to populate that full name property. And then the action to be done is going to be to update a database item. We'll be updating the person who is added from the type form submission. And then once again, our database is going to be the people database. And then automate.io needs to know which item to update. And so we're going to use the page ID for that. And for that, we are going to draw the page ID from the trigger because this is going to be the page that was added. So to do that, we can click the plus sign here. And then within this trigger, we can see the page ID variable. So if we select that, it's going to use the page ID from the trigger. And then from there, what we want to do is just update the full name property because all of the other ones will be populated from the type form submission. So what we can do is once again, draw variables from the trigger. In this case, we want to use the first name. We want to add a space and then we want to use the last name. So this is going to be the content that's populated within the full name property. The first name, a space, and the last name. So then we can save our bot. We can toggle it on. And then we can test it. We'll go to our form and we'll resubmit it with a test submission. And then we'll submit our test submission. And when it appears in our people database, that's going to trigger the automate.io bot. And so what automate.io does is depending on your plan, it will ping the Notion workspace at a certain frequency, and when it sees that added or updated database item, it will proceed with the actions that you've defined. And after just a few minutes, the full name property is automatically populated. So let's move on to a Zapier example. Now, rather than just populating this people database with submissions from Typeform, we might also want to add contacts added to Google Contacts. So what I like to do is I like to have a label called Notion Sync in my Google Contacts. And anytime I want a contact 
added from Google Contacts to Notion, I just apply that label and that ensures that everything remains nice and tidy because Google Contacts can get a little junky. So the first step is going to be to create a sample contact. So we have our sample contact saved. And the next step is going to be configuring that Zapier integration for the first time as we saw previously. We will add a new integration. We'll call it Zapier and the name of the workspace. We'll leave no logo. We'll confirm that our workspace is selected and click submit. So that gives us our token to copy. Then we'll come back to our people database, share it with our Zapier integration, and then go to Zapier and create a new Zap. So our trigger in this case is going to be Google Contacts. And the event is going to be a new or updated contact. And I have already configured Google Contacts in Zapier because we're focused on Notion, but that is pretty straightforward. You'll just sign into your account and then we'll test our trigger. And we can see here that we have all of the information associated with that sample contact. The first name, the last name, and the email address that we entered. And then you can see that Notion Sync is listed within the groups. So that's precisely the sample contact we wanted. And then we'll continue and add our action. Now, what we want to do is... If a contact in Google Contacts is added or updated, we only want to proceed if that group contains the Notion Sync group. So we're going to use an internal app here to filter the contact. So we only want to proceed if the group contains Notion Sync. Then we'll continue and we see that this sample contact would have met that rule. So we can close this action and add another one by selecting that plus sign. And then this is where we want to create an action in Notion. So we'll type Notion, choose it. And the event is going to be to create a database item and continue. And this is where we'll need to configure Notion for the first time. So we'll paste that token and continue. So the database that we want is the people database, which is the only database available because that was the only one we granted access to. And then we're going to want to match each property of the database with the data from Google Contacts. So in this case, we just used the first name, last name, and email address. So we will click within here and then search for those particular items within the Google contact data. And we can actually replicate that full name feature that we created in automate.io by just adding first name and last name here separated by a space.
So that's all the information that we'll use in our example here. So we'll continue. And we can see all of the information that we're going to be using in our test. And so we'll click test and review. And if we go to our people database, we can see that Kara Swisher has been added, including the full name, which comprises the first name and last name separated by a space. So with that successfully in place, we can turn on the zap. And our Zap is fully configured. And lastly, here's a quick list of popular implementations of the Notion API to give you a sense of how you can use it and to inspire your own implementations. You can reschedule or recreate recurring tasks. You can aggregate contacts from Google Contacts, a CRM, an online store, and a membership platform. You can sync your calendar with an events database. You can send tasks to Notion by email or from voice assistance. You can aggregate transactions from banks, online stores, and other financial services. You can automatically publish content to social media, blogs, and your website. You can automate communications at each stage of your sales cycle, including follow-up communications. You can add photos taken on your phone to a Notion gallery, and you can add favorited songs in Spotify to a songs database in Notion. So I'll detail many of these in future resources and feel free to let me know on Twitter if you're particularly eager to see one of these or any others.